studying words, and I guess I'll just start with this. And somebody said, came to me the first service, he's like, I was the one that was praying that God would wreck your message and speak right to me. And thanks a lot for that, David Self. Appreciate it, David Self. Maybe this is for you. But studying this word, word. <laughs> so we, I have, again, this great plan of all these words we're going to break down and dissect the Bible and all of a sudden these different words we've taken. And the Lord tells me, no, you're going to study the word, word. I'm like, great, that's riveting. Yeah. It's 1,307 verses with a word in it. I read all of them. And I'm studying these verses, and I'm trying to wrap my head around Because let, let me just be honest with you. The English language is a primitive language. People talk about how amazing. No, it's not. It's weird. English is weird. It's hard to understand. So when you look up the word, word in the Bible, you have 1,307 times. Guess what? There's more than one word for word in Hebrew and Greek. And they're communicating different things. So I may say some things now that I'll say in a couple weeks, but we're just going to go with what we got right now. So this word has power. And when they would speak about the word, they didn't speak about words just being something you say. They believed words had life on them. There was life on words, and when you speak them, there's power in what you say. And what you'll notice is they, they have a different type of word to describe words it's called sayings. And a lot of what they refer to in just basic speech is sayings. But they would distinguish when you study words. There was our words and there were God's words. And God's word was powerful and it held things together. And I love the book of Hebrews. It's so powerful. I mean, one of the greatest assignments I ever received from a Bible college professor Hardest class in all of our school was Hebrews. So I take this class, and he says, it's incredibly hard. Very few students ever get an A in this class, but I'm going to give you one out. Every time you read the book of Hebrews, I'm going to give you five extra credit points. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good merit system. I trust you. I read it 150 times in the semester. I crushed it. I got an A. Best assignment of my life. And you read this, this beginning passage in Hebrews 1, and it says this. God has spoken and revealed himself through the prophets of old, through visitations and encounters. But in the last days, he's revealed himself through his son, Jesus. It says Jesus has shown up, and you have this writer. It's probably not Paul, I'll be honest with you guys. But you have this writer that we don't know by God's grace. I'm glad they thought it was Paul, so that it was in our canon. But you have this writer that's writing and he's trying to communicate the power of Jesus that is greater than the Old Covenant, that's greater than Melchizedek, that's greater than Abraham, that's greater than Moses, and he's available now. And he says this in Hebrews 1.3. He says, by Jesus, he is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. His word has power. And he starts to unfold his plan, much like John, where, where Jesus is this eternal being, part of the Godhead, but he's part of the creation process. And you have a passage that's very famous, that's often quoted, and it says this in Hebrews 4.12, Behold, the word of God is what? Living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And I was, I was studying this, and often, as I've been taught, when we hear that, we think of the Bible. The word of God is living, active, and sharper than any two-edged sword. So when we hear that, we think, yes, God's word is real. The Bible speaks today. And yes, it does. But that's not the context. Can we apply that to this? Yes, we can. But what the author of Hebrews is saying is that Jesus' words are living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and he splits bone and marrow, and he speaks today. He says, therefore, don't harden your hearts like they did in the wilderness. And when you take that and you read that, they're not thinking, I better go get the Torah. Better go get my scroll. Better go get my papyrus. They couldn't even read. You know, you heard the Bible. You came to church on a Sunday because you didn't have access to it. You didn't have it on your phone. And they would come. But when they hear that, they think, i got to hear what Jesus is speaking to me now. His voice is speaking to me. He's everywhere. i got to hear it. And I came across this haunting poem. 
I'm reading this book by John Ortberg, and I come across this poem. I had to read it twice. I'm like, did I just read what I thought I read? It says this. It's by this woman named Elizabeth Barrett Browning in the 1800s. She wrote hundreds and hundreds of poems. And she started writing at 11. Side note, it's never too young to start hearing God and recording what he's saying. Come on. Encourage your kids. This is what she says, and it's not on the screen, because guess what? God changed the message yesterday. <laughs> Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. Read it again. Earth is crammed. Please close your eyes. Earth is crammed with heaven. And every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. God is everywhere and he's speaking. This isn't some pantheistic message about how God's going to speak through trees and animals. God is real and he's alive and he's trying to get your attention. He's speaking to you. I'm just trying to wrap where I'm going to go right now because I feel we're going to two paths. Watch the first service because we're going to do part two right now. <laughs> Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. God speaks in a very clear way. A passage many of us have heard before. Let's turn there. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Scholars consider this the fulcrum of the entire Old Testament. You ever sit like on a teeter top? That middle piece that has it really centered is called the fulcrum. They say it's, it's so pivotal. This is the hinge point of the entire Old Testament. This verse right here. What Abraham does determines what happens for the rest of human history. See, before this, we have the amazing creation account. And we have this unfolding of God's power and this intimate relationship with humanity. But then we have a breakdown. Chaos ensues. And as God is trying to redeem his creation, he has to go back to that original plan he had. He has to send and give the glory. He says... In this promise, Genesis 3, that he's going to bring the seed from the woman and crush the head of the serpent. So he's watching and he's waiting. As we know in the Old Testament, it says the Spirit of God goes to and fro from out the earth looking for those that worship him. The Spirit of truth. Jesus says in John 4, you can read the others in the Chronicles. God's looking for those that will worship him and give everything to him. In Genesis 12, 1, we have this passage. It's the go passage. It's the amazing passage where Abraham starts his journey. And again, just to keep things simple, we'll call him Abraham, even though it's Abram here. It's a whole other story if you're not familiar with it. But he speaks to Abraham and he responds in obedience. And a lot of us read this, but we miss what leads up to it. See, chapters and verses are awesome. I'm grateful that we have them, but it really messed up a lot of the stories in the Bible. Two men came like, this is the other thing. Chapters and verse numbers are not God-inspired and ordained. Does God use them? Yes. But listen, his text is sacred. What he spoke and was recorded is living and breathing. Those numbers are not living and breathing. And the reality is we miss a lot of stories in their context because of those chapters and verses. So for a lot of us, we think Abraham's story starts in Genesis 12. It doesn't. It's actually incredibly depressing. It starts in Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. It says this, Now these are the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died before his father in the land of his birth, Ur of the Chaldeans. Here we have a family. Most lineages just kind of move on. Here we have a family where the story of their origin deals with the death of a son before his father. This was an absolute tragedy. What this also communicates is this is an incredibly small family. Many would have multiple wives and multiple sons. 
He has one wife and three kids. This would be viewed as a tragedy. So you lose one of your sons a third of your inheritance that is gone. This is how it starts. But yet, his son, before he died, had a grandson. So what the author of Genesis is trying to communicate is he's almost viewed as one of the, uh, the sons in some way. Continues in verse 29. Abram and Nahor took wives with the name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishka. Now Sarai was barren. She had no children. For many of us in modern medicine, we know the pain of barrenness. We know the pain, but there are alternatives. By God's grace, through modern science, we're seeing miracles happen. There's amazing things that have taken place. We also have the ability to adopt which is a beautiful gift for us to redeem incredibly difficult situations that children are born into. That's not Abram's day, and that's not Sarai's life. We have to understand is when the, the writer of Genesis is communicating this, we have the death of a brother, and we have the barrenness of a wife. What it's communicating in some ways is how incredibly upright Abram is for not divorcing her. Abram stays with a woman that's barren. That word at its root meaning means infertile. It literally means to an agrarian society, barren ground or worthless land. So when you hear barren in reference to a woman, it's communicating worthless property because that's all they were viewed as being. So Abram chooses to remain married to her in the midst of her barrenness, is what one scholar writes. Without children, the man had no one to perpetuate his name, and the wife enjoyed little prestige and much frustration, for she had no alternative career to motherhood. Further in old age, childless couples had no children to care for them, and after death, none to carry out the funerary rites regarded as vital to the soul's well-being in the afterlife. What we learn is this, is this place that he's built in, Ur, is a religious center. So much idolatry is there as they've uncovered it in the archaeological, archaeological record. There we go. As they've uncovered this, there's so many idols that were worshipped there. So they would believe that your kids were not only part of your lineage and carry on your name, they were responsible for making sure you had a proper burial to honor the gods. And if you didn't have kids, no one would bury you properly, therefore you had a really rough afterlife. You had no inheritance, which means the gods didn't view you favor favorably, therefore you're probably cursed. That's the context here. So with Abram in this very dire situation, it continues. Verse 31. Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son, Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. Just to make a note in your Bible, they're headed to Canaan. Here's what we have to understand. This was against the grain of cultural migration. People were leaving Canaan, not going towards Canaan. And what they write here is it's literally like going in the opposite direction of a current, which has caused many scholars to believe there must have been some instruction from God before Genesis 12. There's no reason for him to leave Ur. This was now the established city center. You are safe if you stay in Ur. But they start to move against the current of the Amorite migration, which means God must have spoken something. This is not normal. This is very unusual, especially with a tribe with a barren daughter and a dead son. It's not normal. So there had to be something there. So a lot of people believe Abram received a call and his father comes with him. And here's a chilling verse. They went to the land of Canaan, but when they came to Haran, they settled there. This word Haran means the wide road. The wide road. The established place. When they came to Haran, they settled there. It means to sit down. I was praying this week for us. I was haunted by that verse. Because a lot of us have settled in the wide road. A lot of us have settled 
God has spoken some type of movement to you, and you've chosen the place to settle. Now again, it's not coming against you. You might be exhausted. You might be tired. You might have tragedy like this family. Settling made sense. And this verse doesn't condemn them. It's just the reality. It was easier to stay there. But I'm haunted by the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. The wide road, the easy road. It's simple to settle in. But Jesus says that's the pathway to death. Behold, there are many who take it, for the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few that find it. It's a paradoxical verse. It says the easy road, those that perceive fruitful ground, that's death, but the hard road is life. And as I was praying this week, I just heard the Lord say, stop settling. Stop settling for what's easy. Stop settling for what is simple. Because guess what? The life of carrying a cross will cost you something. But there's life on the other side of it. There's an eternal life. And what we get broken in church is this concept of eternal life. We think of other life. Well, the Bible never says that. It's right now. There's a life that doesn't expire now that is available to you that gives what? Rest to your soul. A lot of us get ashamed talking about Jesus in our relationships with people that don't know him. We assume that life in secular culture, what the Bible would call sin, is somewhat fulfilling. We assume that their life may have some semblance of ease because they communicate how great their life is. Listen, you will not have a soul rest without Jesus. There's a rest of the soul that only Jesus can satisfy. So he says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and you will find rest for what? Your souls. Just preaching messages of prosperity and great lives is not going to change culture. Yeah. There was a life that was transformed and changed the power of the resurrection displayed through Jesus that's available to you now. We can't assume that sin is satisfying for our friends. You say, I struggle with Christianity and these stuff. Yes, it's tough. But there's a soul rest you have access to that the world does not. I find it. I hear it all the time. I listen to so much, so many podcasts, so many YouTube channels, listening to the ache of culture that's crying out for a savior to bring them sanity. And they're trying to find it in politics. They're trying to find it in sexuality. They're trying to find it. This is a culture that needs a voice of clarity that's only found in Jesus. A soul rest only found in Jesus. And today he brought you here to let you know that he is what? The way, the truth, and the life. There's a life in him that only you can access through the cross. And a lot of us have settled for the easy road. But in the midst of settling, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of this should be honestly where we just stay. I know there was a word to Canaan, but it's too hard to get there. What happens? God in his grace says, go. See, one of the beauties of the Old Testament is we have, again, not the grace of the cross that has access for everybody. But we have a God that's gracious even in the midst of disobedience. You want to study the heroes of the Bible? They live jacked up lives. I mean, no one's walking away from the story of Abraham thinking, so, man, this guy crushed it all the time. I was listening to a lecture this week, and they were talking with a secular guy talking about Abraham's journey. He's like, I really don't understand why the Bible records so many of the errors of their patriarchs. <laughs> proof for God and that he's real. These are honest texts. They don't come away as heroes and champions. I heard one guy ask me a question trying to defend Abraham lying about it not being his wife later on. He's like, no, it was a bad decision. 
<laughs> no God in that at all. It's even God that's gracious and merciful. And if you've settled, He says, come. Come and follow. But don't miss the day of your visitation. Come and follow me. So what does Abraham do? He goes. So one scholar says, the word of God enters into a point of great uncertainty for the future of this family. God is speaking right now. In the place of your uncertainty, in the place of your discomfort, in the place of your disillusionment, He is speaking. We just have to ask, where is the voice coming from? In what ways is He showing up? In what ways is God delivering you? We need to break off specificity with how God is going to speak to us. A lot of us say, well, if God does it this way, then it will happen. Then I know it's God. No, it's not. Because what we do is we make those ideas our God. We make those pre-qualifiers our King. And it puts you in charge. Guess who's in charge? Him, not you. And your life's in disarray because he's not number one. He's not boss. Whenever they said Jesus Christ is Lord, they meant everything. Yeah. Guess who was Lord? Caesar, not Jesus in that day. So when they called Jesus Lord, you know what they called them? The atheists. Because they didn't believe that there was a God that you could see, touch, or worship. They believed in some invisible force that moved and brought words of power. That's what they believed. So what does Abraham do? Here's what it says in another scholar. Go by yourself in the climactic development country, clan, and father's house. Add a punch to the command and emphasize the uncompromising nature of God's word. God's word is not to be compromised. We have all these stories where people take part of God's truth and try to tack their own future on top of it. You know, Achan, sin of Achan, he buries idols underneath his tent, curse comes on the whole tribe. Then we have Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. The word of God cannot be compromised. You have to follow it with everything. The quick progress, progression from land to father's house draws attention to the costliness of obedience. Your obedience will cost you everything. It will cost you your social status. It will cost you your job. But who's really your provider? Think about this. If you're invited to your boss's office and God said, speak this to them, and your inner dialogue is, but Lord, I'd lose my job, would you do it? Who's really boss now? Being a Christian costs you a lot. As Morgan said, why do I worry? God's not worried. God's not worried. God's got you. If a lot of us have settled, we've settled for things that we never meant to settle for. Stop settling. It's time to go. It's time to go. Leave your father's house. Leave the place of practical provision. Leave the place of safety and security. Leave that place to the life of adventure. He's called to you. He's called you for adventure. He's called you for more. Stop settling for Sunday. It's time to say yes to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, as we close. So Abram went as the Lord told him. And lot with him. Abraham was what? 75 years old when he departed. 75 years old when he departed the wide road to go to the difficult path. It's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. Stop hoping that you were younger to make these decisions. Well, it would have cost me less if I would have done it then. Stop. He was 75. 
You know what he left? His inheritance. This is all of Luke chapter 9, right here. Luke chapter 9, when the three men come to Jesus and say, I'll be your disciple, but if, but if, but if. Abraham does all three of them in one. He leaves his father's house, leaves a funeral, which there's debate as to when his dad actually died. And he doesn't know where he's going. To a land unforeseen. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my is speaking. And you may feel like you're in darkness. You may feel like you're in obscurity. You may feel like you're in a place of confusion. As we read in Hebrews chapter 1, his word holds everything together and he's speaking because his word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Matthew 28 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, but ends with, behold, I am with you always. It may feel like you're going alone, but guess what? You got some good backup. It may feel like you're going alone, but you have the Spirit. Jesus is with you and He's waiting and He's welcoming you to sacrifice easy and welcoming you to sacrifice what you've settled for. Will you say yes to that call? This morning I have a good friend, Terry, share her story. I will give warning. Her, her story is amazing and wild. If you have young ones here, uh, you'll probably have to talk through some things after the service, but I would encourage you, don't take them out, because the world's already trying to educate them in things that the church is intended to speak truth to. So this morning, I want to welcome a good friend, Terry Arana, as she shares. And thank you, it's going to be a good morning. Good morning, Terry. Was I born gay? I was convinced I was. Born and raised in Southern California and Protestant, whatever that means. Jesus' birth at Christmas and prayers at holiday dinners only. June 13 of 1963, my brother Michael dies at age three. Tonsillectomy turned tragic. My dad blamed God and checked out and stayed at work. My mom got angry, and my brother Todd was lost, not quite a year old, searching for his big brother. December 4th of that year, I was born with a dislocated hip. <clears throat> in my late 30s, I would get an answer in part of why I thought I could never please my mom, why she was always angry with me. My aunt in therapy with my mom disclosed that my mom hit her stomach while pregnant with me screaming at God, why didn't you take this one? I don't even know. As a young child, I was called a tomboy and my brother a fag. Just because I didn't wear girly clothes and I was better at sports than my brother at this age. On hot summer days, I ran around the neighborhood with no shirt on until one day my mom said, Terry, we need to go put a shirt on. And by the way, we need to get you a bra. Inside, I screamed, what the heck is she talking about, a bra, yuck. I didn't understand why guys got to run around and I now was trapped. My first suicidal thought came at age six, sitting on the laundry room floor, crying out to God to take me. I couldn't take this life anymore. He brought my dog, and when he licked my face, this moment passed. There would be many, many more episodes throughout my life of self-harm, always in fear of everything push-pulled. Doctors, special ed tutors, speech teachers, summer school, not understanding anything and not understood. I was always in trouble and I didn't know why. Yelling and screaming was the norm. I was called the problem child. I was bullied and then became the bully. My brother favored. Fourth grade, I heard that I, would go, I wouldn't go to school because it was my first male teacher. But this was the year I witnessed a group of girls carving their names into their arms like tattoos. 
Sports were my outlet. Still fearful, but I was good at it and people would cheer me on. Boys would pick me for their team first and after the game was over, so was I. Passed over and never asked to dance. High school using drug, alcohol drugs got me accepted into the big guys on campus and those already out of school. My friends' families were more of a family to me, so I was never at home. First time I ever witnessed a mother reading her Bible and TBN on the TV. I always wanted to be over there, and my mom tried to stop me one day. She said, what is it? Are you guys lesbians? This would be the first time I put my hands on my mother and I slammed her against the wall. There would be many other demonic explosions throughout my life. I hated her and I loved her. They gave me a diploma, already told only money for my brother for college. And I never told about the volleyball scholarship offered from Long Beach State. There was no way I could cheat my way through college. And I thought I wasn't good enough anyways. That Thanksgiving dinner table, I was pressured by my family. What are you going to do with your life? Be a beach bum? So I did only what I knew how to do. I went to Laguna Beach, took way too much acid, and God interrupted my buzz and told me to go into the Army and don't tell anyone. I was so scared. I took the test. I lost five pounds, and I was going to be a truck driver. Nobody wanted me to go in except my mother. 1983 basic training, Fort Dix, New Jersey, there was a group of girls off to the side, and I wanted to be a part of their group. They shut me out because I would speak of hating homosexuals and spraying them with fire hydrants at the bus stops. One of these girls took me under her wing, and I had my first experience with her. But wait, my family and my friends would disown me. Off to Germany, heartbroken, and rejected from this girl, but not being a hater of gays anymore, compassion. I met my husband, yes, I was married. <laughs> I met my husband, and when we finished our military duty, we moved to my hometown. Cocaine came into the picture. My closest friends told me they, they were all gay, and I told them about my experience. I started going to the gay bars with them and prayed out loud. God, I would only leave my husband if he would cheat on me. My husband had no characteristics of unfaithfulness, but it happened. Later, the Lord would disclose to me that cocaine, meth, and heroin were literally the devil's potion. I started to use meth to lose weight, and now I was convinced I was gay and lived that lifestyle. 1989, miraculously, I passed the test in academy and became a youth correctional officer. Such a hypocrite with everything. Do as I say, not as I do. A co-worker gave me a Bible and turned me on to Joyce Meyer. I never read the Bible, just kept it in my vehicle. I do remember when the subject of homosexuality came up, I said, well, man wrote that, not God. So blind and so deaf. I always felt so much pain around me and through me that I would use more and more meth to harden my heart. People wanted me at their parties, but behind closed doors I was hitting walls, abusing loved ones, and killing myself, spiritually dead. 2003, I medically retired, I had a nervous breakdown, and moved to Sacramento to get away from meth, but I just found it here. Hospitals, psychiatrists, psychologists, diagnosed bipolar, a little schizo, my mom always yelling and screaming. Personality disorder, manic, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, and last but not least, suicidal. The house I rented became a crack den, and I was a shot caller, demonic to say the least. All the pharmaceutical medications I was on were all weight gainers, and one Christmas morning, I found myself at my end in the emergency room, 400 pounds. I couldn't breathe, and my shins were splitting down the middle and pouring out water. I cried out to God, if you are real, show me a sign. 2012, August 19th, I walked into Warehouse Christian Ministries in Sacramento to hear some music. The pastor said, we are having an open baptism at the park later, and even if you were baptized as an infant and you re re 
and you respect Jesus, come and get baptized. I had so much fear in me, but I went, and supernaturally things started happening. Sexual encounter stopped, and I was comfortable sleeping on the couch. But, but I was still gay, right? My partner and I became domestic partners for legal purposes for rights in hospitals. And when the law said we could get married, I began making plans. I started hearing this voice inside me. Ask the doctors about medical marijuana. The doctor said I was a good candidate and I was off all pharmaceutical medications and using only alternative meds. At a Joyce Myers conference in Sacramento, I went to, I asked out loud, Jesus, if you're real, show me a sign. He showed me two. I said hi to this lady in a nice shirt. She was wearing a Joyce Myers t-shirt. She said nothing and left. Feeling embarrassed, I thought, oh, she must not have heard me. She came back and bought me a shirt, and it fit. And when they played this season on TV, out of all those people, there I was, and Joyce talking about covering up scars. April 2014, the Sunrise Mall had an event called The 99. Live actors playing ultimate near-death experiences, hell and Jesus at the cross. My partner and I said yes to prayer at the end. I had asked her, and I'll be able to thank you enough. And I said, I'm looking for more Thumper Church. I didn't even know what that meant or what even home church was. It just came out of my mouth. She told me about the Rock of Roseville. I live in Rancho Cordova, and the Lord took me to a church close to me, to be, me there, but it was clear. He said, I just want to show you something, but this is not your home. I went to the rock, and someone helped me fill out the, the newcomer's card. When it came to marital status, I said, sorry, I have a domestic partner. I don't even know why I was apologizing, but she said, that's okay, welcome. I was so scared, but the Lord told me to go to the front row and sit. I went to the middle of the front row, and a man came up to me and hugged me. It was Pastor Francis. I was not a hugger <laughs> and, and was like, who is, who is this guy? The Lord spoke to me that day and said, this is your home. Shortly after that, I was in, in my mobile home and the heavens opened up and an audible voice said, my word is true. I hit the deck and fell on my face. I was shaking, but I felt so much love. I lifted my head and said, but Lord, how am I to read the Bible? You know I cheated my way through high school, that's how I tell you. Then the soft voice came from my heart and said, that's why I brought you the Holy Spirit. He is going to teach you. The Holy Spirit started teaching me about tithing and giving, that it was about trusting God with everything. Pawn shops no more, praise God church altar call. If you have something you want to get rid of, come, give it to the Lord. I knelt down and said, Lord, take meth from me. I was supernaturally healed, 25 years of addiction gone, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Thirst and hunger kept me going. Reading the word was amazing. God was speaking to me. I read marriage between a man and a woman. Told my partner we can't get married. No problem. She never thought she was gay anyways. <laughs> that was a plus, right? <laughs> but I thought I was still born that way. Then it happened. I was getting free food at this Catholic church, and a Christian African-American older gentleman said to me, abomination. I didn't even know what we were talking about, but I will never forget the look on his face. Did that just come out of my mouth? <laughs> my stomach hurt. My stomach hurt so my stomach hurt. And I looked up this word on my roommate's phone when I got home. Homosexuality, an abomination to God. I hit the floor crying. God, how can this be? I thought I was born this way. I then saw a real-to-real -real vision of my life and choices I had made. 
I renounced and repented and have never struggled in this area again. I received confirmation that the Lord gives real the real visions. It was a healing night and a, and a Muslim lady shared her testimony about an encounter with Jesus, a real to real vision of her life and she gave herself her life to Jesus. I chose to go deeper and deeper Every prayer group, every conference, two Dakamos training, renouncing, repenting, and inner healing sessions. After fasting and praying 12 days, the Lord freed me from all medications. Five years, no alcohol, no cigarettes, no drugs, no meds, no sex on purpose, and no struggles in these areas. I am a beloved daughter, uniquely and wonderfully made. I am the bride of Christ, Christ in me, the hope of glory. I am just a normal Christian, a child of God, just like you. I love you.